Hello everybody, I'm here with chapter 23 of book 1 of the Ranger's Apprentice the Early Years series, The Tournament at Gorlin. Let's go ahead and get into it. These days, the Rangers had to search for a larger campsite when they stopped for the night. Halt and Crowley continued to share the lean-to tarpaulin they had been using since they had began their journey. The others each had a small, one-man ranger tent, which they pitched in a semicircle facing the fireplace each night. Their horses, being ranger-trained, didn't need restraining at night, but were left to wander free and graze in the vicinity of the campsite. But the extra numbers meant that they needed to be more organized than they had been before so Crowley assigned camp tasks to each of them. He and Halt volunteered to continue with the preparation of meals, and, since they were good cooks, the others agreed readily. The more menial tasks of gathering firewood, building a fireplace, and fetching water were all assigned on a rotating roster to the others, as was the cleaning of pots and pans used for cooking. Each ranger cleaned his own plate and eating utensils, and all of them contributed to the pot by hunting. The weather continued fine, although the nights were chilly. But camping outdoors was no hardship to such seasoned travelers, and, in the evenings, after they had eaten, Berrigan would usually sit and coax pleasant melodies from his guitar. Norris, it turned out, was an expert fisherman, and he loved to spend the last hour of daylight sitting beside a stream with a long, limber fishing pole extended over the water. He had an uncanny knack of sensing where fish might lie, and often supplemented their larder with fresh river trout or the occasional succulent salmon. When such opportunities arose, he was excused from the daily chores of setting up camp. The prospect of fresh fish for dinner more than compensated for the extra work the others had to undertake. All in all, Hall thought, if it weren't for the deadly serious reason underlying their journey, it would have been a very pleasant interlude. On this particular evening, Norris had managed to land a three-kilogram salmon for their supper. Halt and Crowley had wrapped the cleaned fish liberally covered in butter and slices of wild-growing onion and lemon, in bark and large leaves so that it was completely sealed, then created an earth oven by shoveling red-hot coals from the fire into a small trench they dug next to the fireplace proper. They laid the wrapped fish into the trench, then covered it with more coals. Finally, they heaped earth over the layer of coals and left the fish to steam and roast inside the leaves while they sliced potatoes and fried them in butter in a cast iron pan, with mushrooms and wilted greens to go with them. The group sat around the fire when the meal was served, eating steadfastly, without too much conversation to slow down the eating process. Finally, Berrigan leaned back after his third helping licked his buttery fingers, and sighed contentedly. "'It's a pleasure to have you aboard,' he said to Norris, who frowned, not understanding. "'Aboard?' he said. "'Aboard what? We're not on a ship.' As has been stated, Norris tended to take things literally. Berrigan simply smiled at him. "'I mean, it's a pleasure to have you around.' if you can produce fish like that one. Oh, thank you, said Norris. He smiled awkwardly. He wasn't a man who was used to compliments. Berrigan cleaned his greasy fingers on a convenient piece of cloth, realizing too late that it was the hem of his cloak, and shrugged. A few stains and smears on one's clothes never hurt anyone. In fact, he thought, as he looked down his nose at the irregular, greasy stain, it might well add to the camouflage qualities of his cloak. 
He glanced across the fire to where Leander was absentmindedly wiping his hands on the front of his shirt. Beside him, Crowley belched gently. We're a refined lot, aren't we? Halt said. We'd be a big hit at a formal dinner at Castle Araluen. Crowley shrugged. We're not at a formal dinner party. We're in camp. Camp manners and castle manners are two different things. So I've noticed, Halt said. Then he belched as well. Raised in Castle Dun Kilty in Clonmel, he had been taught to behave with strict table manners and politeness in his youth, and he was enjoying the freedom of being on the road with such an easy-going group. The belch was a long and resounding one, and he smiled in satisfaction. Better out than in, he said. Egon gave him a sidelong glance. Not for those of us who are out here with it. Halt considered that, and nodded. He couldn't argue with it. The beauty of cooking the salmon the way they had done was that there was no pot to clean afterward. The cast-iron pan in which they had cooked the potatoes needed cleaning and scouring, however. So Egon checked the water bucket and saw it was only a quarter full. I'll get water, he said, and moved off into the shadows, soon being lost among the trees. Even on such a mundane task as fetching water, Rangers tended to be as unobtrusive as possible, instinctively moving from one patch of shade or cover to the next. It was a lifelong skill that they practiced constantly and unthinkingly. On more than one occasion, a ranger's life had been saved by the practice. We should reach Redmont tomorrow, Crowley said. I'll be interested to see how Baron Erold greets us. They were currently an Eagleton fief, and had spent the past two days inquiring about one of the dismissed rangers, a man named Samdash, but they had had no success. People in the villages they had passed through had given them no word of the rangers' present whereabouts. Crowley's inquiries were met with blank looks and a stony silence. Finally, they had decided to abandon the search for Samdash and proceed to the adjoining Redmont fief. Who's the ranger at Redmont again? Halt asked. He had been told, but he was full of delicious food and a little drowsy, so the effort of searching his memory for the man's name seemed too much. Farrell, Crowley told him. Berrigan looked up at the name. He's a good man. Leander nodded agreement. One of the best. He'll be a great addition to the group. He's fought in more than one battle on the northern frontier when he was assigned to Norgate Fief. I hear he uses a battle axe in close combat. Frighten the lights out of more than one Scotty warrior, I believe. Is that allowed? Halt asked. I didn't think rangers were encouraged to use heavy, close-range weapons like axes and swords. Technically, we're not. But who's going to tell a man with a battle axe? Berrigan said. His eyes half closed as he leaned back and enjoyed the heat radiating from the fire. Crowley yawned hugely. We should start thinking of turning in, he said, trying to remember whose turn it was for the first watch. The prospect of his bedroll was a very pleasant one. He looked up curiously as Cropper emerged from the trees and emitted a low-level grunting noise. What is it, boy? Then, understanding dawned, and he started to his feet, his hand reaching for the sax knife where it lay in its scabbard on the fallen tree trunk he had been using for a backrest. Before he could draw the weapon, however, an arrow hissed across the clearing and slammed, quivering into the log, a few centimeters from his hand. Don't anybody move, a harsh voice said out of the darkness. There are four of us, and we all have arrows ready knocked. Four indistinct figures moved out of the shadows under the trees. Crowley, 
his night vision ruined by staring into the glowing coals of the fire, squinted to see them more clearly. As they came into the circle of light thrown by the fire, he could see they were all dressed in ranger cloaks and carried massive longbows. As the speaker had said, each one of them had an arrow knocked on the string, drawn back about thirty centimeters. There was an air of competence and quiet confidence about them that told him they could draw fully and shoot in less than a second if necessary. Slowly, Crowley moved his hand away from the sacks. Take it easy, he said, his voice calm and untroubled. We're not your enemies. We'll decide that, said the speaker. His face was hidden in the shadow of his cowl, with only the lower third visible. Crowley, Halt, and the others were caught at a disadvantage, lying relaxing against the trunk of the tree. Halt studied the four figures. He rolled slightly to one side and used his fingertips to slide his throwing knife out of its scabbard, keeping it concealed beneath his body. As he moved, the second figure from the right turned to cover him, the partly drawn arrow shaft pointing in his direction. Don't do anything silly, the man warned him. His voice sounded younger than that of the original speaker, but his features too were concealed in the shadow of his cowl. Halt held his hands up in submission. Wouldn't dream of it, he said mildly. Who are you? Crowley asked. The original speaker turned to face him directly, although his face was still hidden by the cowl. That's funny, he said. I seem to be the one with the bow, so I would have thought I'd be the one asking the questions. He paused a few seconds, letting that sink in, then continued in a harder tone. Who are you? My name is Crowley. I'm a former ranger, as I'm guessing you are, and these are my companions, Halt, Berrigan. He got no further. The cowed man interrupted roughly. Actually, I don't really care who you are. I want to know why you've been asking about me. A look of understanding came over Crowley's face. You're Sam Dash? The other man made a peremptory gesture with the point of his arrow. You're fond of answering a question with one of your own, aren't you? He said. Yes, I'm Sam Dash. Now why have you been asking about me? Did Morgoroth send you to hunt us down? Morgoroth? Crowley said with a hollow laugh. Far from it. I'm no friend of his. None of us are. So you say. Nevertheless. Put your weapons down. Now! Egon's voice came from the darkness behind the four men. Sam Dash tensed and began to turn around, but Egon spoke again. No. Don't turn around or I'll shoot he said calmly. Sam Dash stopped the movement and cursed under his breath. He hadn't been told how many men were in the group who were asking about him. The villagers who had told him had been hazy on that point. Five or six, they'd said. Obviously, he realized now, it had been six. But he didn't let his sense of frustration show as he spoke again. You do realize there are four of us, and only one of you, he said. We could easily... He flinched violently as two arrows slammed in quick succession into a tree stump by his knee. You couldn't easily do anything, Egon said, but I could easily take down two of you before you could turn, as you just saw. In spite of himself... Sam Dash looked down at the two shafts quivering in the stump. That had been extremely fast shooting. Ranger train shooting, he thought. In addition, I'm behind you and in the dark, whereas you're outlined against the fire where I can see you. Before your other two men could locate me, I'd have plenty of time to hit them as well. He paused, then added, 
Of course, that won't be of much interest to you, because you'll be the first one to die. Samdash ground his teeth together in frustration and anger. He had been careless, he realized. They had spent the afternoon searching for the small group who were asking after him, finally locating them by the glint of their fire through the trees. Then, instead of waiting and watching to ascertain how many of them there were, he had led his men forward impulsively, and now they had been outflanked. Taking a deep breath, he glanced sideways at his three companions. Ease your strings, boys, he said, and lay your bows down, as he says. Four bowstrings were let down with a series of slight creaks. The bows were set on the ground, and the arrows returned to their quivers. Crowley waited until the thread was removed, then rose slowly and walked forward. To Sam Dash's slight bewilderment, he held his hand out in greeting. As I was saying, I'm Crowley, and I'm delighted to meet you. And that's going to bring us to the end of chapter number 23. Thank you for joining me, thank you for listening, and I will see you all next time in chapter 24. God bless, and have a good one.